Good afternoon. I'm Gloria Nelson with Tug, your host today, and we are so glad to have you join us for our Tug Connects 365 programming. Now, as you settle in and get ready for the start of today's webinar, let me give a brief introduction for Tug, the usergroup.org, for both our current members and those of you who represent organizations that have not yet joined our online community of Infor Distribution Software users. Now, we've all heard that saying that knowledge is power, and I can say with the utmost confidence that after today's presentation, you'll be waking up tomorrow with a little more of both. Tug webinars, online forums, and member events facilitate the timely exchange of ideas and information to help you work smarter and with more confidence. And no matter how you slice it, that's a powerful combination. If you're currently a member, it pays to get even more involved. And if you're not, please visit our website to discover why 2300 heads are better than one to help you be the best at what you do each and every day. Now, before we get started, allow me to touch base with some housekeeping information. We'd like to have you buckle up for about 35 to 45 minutes of content. We will be taking polling questions and also questions from the audience. So we'll make sure that you get the answers that you need. So without any further ado, I encourage you to take a moment, open your Q&A bubble, because that allows other people to like maybe the same question that they would want to have answered and populate it and upvote it to the top of the questions that that formulate. And also, if you need to chat with us, I'll be monitoring that. You can chat with us as panelists and hosts as well. Now, before we go any further, I just want to say it is my pleasure to turn things over to what I call the Brian Squared team today. We have Brian Friedel, who is Vice President of Business Development with White Cup. And also we have Brian Harrington, who is the owner of Focus 10 Consulting. So I'm going to say, Brian Friedel, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Gloria. Hey, it's great to be here. Uh, what I want people to know is before I got involved in the software side with White Cup, uh, I was in distribution for 24 years myself. So super glad to be a part of this and get a chance to connect with the distribution world. I have invited Mr. Brian Harrington here with us, a great partner of ours, great guy, ties to distribution himself. And uh, we work with him on various consulting and implementation uh, opportunities. And so this is right up his alley. And uh, Brian, really nice to have you here. Well, thank you, Brian. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, let's just jump right into it. Uh, I'm Brian Harrington. I'm the owner of Focus 10 Consulting. All right. So uh, today, let's talk about our agenda. Um, the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to uh, talk about our buyer and seller cycles, then we're going to talk about some mental traps we tend to fall into. And we're going to talk specifically about how this affects salespeople. Um, then we'll discuss uh, how analytics can help. And then finally, we'll introduce a tool you can use. So, boom, there we go. Okay. So buyers and sellers, right? So we're going to start with, uh, it's an interaction of two processes, right? When we buy something, somebody's selling us something. So let's, let's look at the buyer's journey. First, we have awareness, right? We, we know we now need something. Then we have consideration. We go and we look for options that might solve our problem. Uh, at a certain point, we'll figure out we need to spend some money on something. So we develop intent to uh, go and purchase something. Finally, we make the purchase. We've decided to spend the money. We've selected the item. We've purchased it. And then finally, uh, after that, we've gotten the thing. We have two things we can do. We can either recommend a friend or we don't, right? Or we can repurchase if it's a, a, a consumable or not. Uh, then the sales cycle, right? We have, uh, for, for most organizations, uh, sales cycle involves prospecting, which is identifying your potential new customers, uh, contacting them, you know, reaching out and uh, beginning the process of the next step, which is qualifying. When we qualify, we want to make sure that the problem they have is a problem we can solve and that we want to do business with them and they want to do business with us. Finally, then we, we make our presentation, whether that's a quote, a traditional pitch or, or whatever. Um, we have some objections and negotiations where we work through uh, all that stuff. And then finally, we close it. And that's the end of the deal, right? Except it's not. We need to generate referrals. So, you know, as we all know, referrals are the best source of customers. 
Um, so, uh, this, there's a shared, um, interest that we have, uh, as buyers and sellers, uh, it's fundamental to the, uh, market economy. There's a little bit of friction here, right? Buyers want a low price, uh, but sellers want a high price, right? We want to make as much profit as we can. The sheer volume of interactions that we have creates that invisible hand effect that Adam Smith documented way back in the 1770s in his The Wealth of Nations. And as we all know, there are factors besides price that go into a purchase selection. When we're shopping for a major purchase, those factors that beat price may be availability, especially right now, convenience, credit, uh, brand loyalty. So think for like major purchases, we um, might drop some and add some uh, requirements in there that affect our, um, our buying cycle. Uh, for example, car shopping right now. If you want, my apologies, if you want a car, uh, you have to take what they have. So you'd privilege availability over any other factor, including price up to your reservation price, uh, the limit of what you'd spend. However, if you're willing to wait, uh, price may weigh heavier on your decision making. So you, your brand loyalty or convenience, location of the dealer, what have you, would uh, affect your purchase decision. Uh, when we're talking about the relationship sales, though, uh, we move through our process more slowly than we do in simple transactive sales. When you know that uh, you need a replacement sink drain cover upper thing that goes on top of the disposal thing, you know, it's that that black thing. I They have a name, I'm certain, but that's how I describe them when I need them because I have had to buy this more than once. Um, you go to a place like, say, Menards. I'm here in the Midwest. Uh, we can save big money there. And so long as the price is within what I think it should be, which I would say is about $10, give or take, I'm just going to buy it. I'm in control as the buyer. The seller has done nothing besides put a price and put it on the shelf to induce me to purchase it. But let's say now I'm shopping for a refrigerator. Ah, shoot, my apologies. You can't just go into a store and buy a refrigerator. Uh, there's delivery and then you have to get rid of the old one and somebody's got to do the plumbing thing to hook the water up. I never get that right. It always leaks. So I want somebody to do that for me. Um, you know, there's always also these questions about now they have screens and they have Wi-Fi enabling and you're going to engage in a longer process. You have to interact with a salesperson. And this is an opportunity then for the seller to influence the cycle. Competent and successful sellers are in it for the long term. They know they have to build trust-based relationships with their buyers, even when it's for rare major purchases. And that's because, as we said, referrals are always our best source of leads. So there's this whole field of research that goes into this topic, right? This is social psychology and also industrial organizational psychology. Uh, there's a couple key points here. First, anonymous and transactive relationships don't lead to long-term success. We can move out of uh, transactive by sharing information, especially information that the buyer could see as valuable and by solving problems with our customers. It confirms some old adages like the best opportunity to get a better customer is when something goes wrong. What kind of information are we talking about disclosing to the buyer? Well, be personal, be specific, and when possible, make sure it's something they value. If your buyer is more likely to share, if you share, your buyer is more likely to share. It's like kindergarten all over again. Uh, Brian, I think you had something to say on this. Well, you know, a wise person in distribution once explained this to me in terms of, you know, who's going to lead and, and taking the initiative and making the sales process what you want. And, and what he said to me was, be the thermostat, not the thermometer, right? Set the temperature instead of just riding up and down with it. I mean, if all you do is mirror back your buyer without asserting some control, some you know, willingness to guide through the process, then you're not offering them anything they can latch onto. How do they pick you? How do they pick you if all you're doing is reflecting back to them? So uh, I've found a lot of success in making a point of you know, encouraging and managing and um, you know, inspiring a sales process as you go. Mm -hmm. 
great points. I, I, I like that. Be the thermostat, not the thermometer. I really like that. So before we move to our next slide, I want everybody to, to, to jot down the last four digits of your, of your mobile phone number. Just take a moment, jot them down, keep them in your head. Just have that number. Now, I want you to estimate the year the Taj Mahal was built and write that number down next to it. Now, between your, um, and, and you know, was, was the Taj Mahal built before or after? Just keep this in your head. Uh, two, one, all right. So 1631 was the year it was built. And unless you're you know, a, a Jeopardy buff, that's probably not something that was easily available to you. Um, but this question comes from some seminal work in the field of social psychology. It, it expresses a phenomena called anchoring. So that number, what typically happens is your number, if it tends to be low, what you think is low, you'll, you'll judge high. And if you think it's high, you'll judge low. Most people are nowhere near the right answer because we started with this number. Um, and anchors are often irrelevant and they throw us off. And we're going to get to more on that in a bit. So we have three major traps. Um, and that's because we use brains. And sales is something we do. And we're using our brain when we do it. Um, I like to think I'm pretty bright. I think most people do. Uh, I enjoy solving puzzle, puzzles and um, writing papers for class. I, I, I Getting my MBA right now. I'm, I'm very much a nerd with this stuff. But... And then... I, but I get led astray. Uh, we just saw that our brains uh, may not be so good at figuring things out when we have these anchors. So we're going to talk about anchoring and framing, the availability heuristic, and categorical error. And, and we're going to get to this as fancy words, but they're pretty simple concepts. So uh, anchoring and framing, right? Uh, most people are influenced by irrelevant information, and that's because the number primed us, right? It becomes the anchor. And anchors lead us to think that irrelevant information is relevant. Um, and because of that, we're actually blinded to the real information that um, could help us. And what that all means in the long run is we're not exercising great problem solving. Um, because they promote fear and risk aversion. Uh, Gloria, why don't we go ahead and launch our first poll? Okay, so first one's up, and this is a fun one. Um, you, I will give you either $10,000 right now, or we can flip a coin, and you could take $22,000 if it comes up heads. Which option would you take? So select either 10,000 or 22,000, hit submit, and we'll see what happens. No, you can't have both. Okay. All right, fun. All right, we got 50-50 on this. Three of, uh, three of the six respondents, 10,000. Three of the six, 22,000. So... Why does this matter? It's a framing trap. Um, Kahneman and Sversky, uh, two amazing researchers. Daniel Kahneman uh, has some popular texts out there, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, um, among others. Uh, Tversky was passed away uh, a while ago. But these two uh, won uh, Nobel Prizes for their work. Um, they showed that generally we prefer the 10,000 over the 22,000, even though probabilistically speaking, we're better off with the $22,000 option. And that's because probability of heads and tails, 50% each. So 22 times 0.5 is $11,000. But we choose the 10,000 because we like certainty more than chance, even when chance would work to our benefit. Uh, before we get too deep, um, 
the the important thing to know here is that you know you could um, take the ten grand and you're fine, but you could have had twenty two thousand dollars, and so eleven thousand is the basis. The research these guys did was amazing. They were grad students in Israel, and they heard this economist economist say something that made them laugh: that people are rational beings and generally make good decisions. Um, they casted humans not as homo sapiens, but homo economists. It's this thing that doesn't exist, the perfect rational actor. Uh, they went around and asked statisticians and uh, economists and mathematicians this very question, and most of them would prefer the $10,000. And again, near certainty, or near-term certainty, we prefer over potential long-term re rewards. So, the availability bias, right? That's anchoring and, and framing. Um, when you read about uh, an aircraft accident uh, or something traumatic, right? It may affect you. When you witness it in person, it affects you differently. The events are the same, but you're likely less inclined to fly if you saw the accident. Uh, availability is critical to our thinking. Our memories aren't like a video camera. We don't just roll back the tape. We piece things together. And we make decisions through emotion and cognition. Both of these are influenced by our experiences. Not all experiences matter to our memory, and we certainly don't remember everything we did. And this is why eyewitness testimony is generally unreliable. Uh, that said, the reason we like eyewitness testimony is that we can connect with it emotionally. We, it feels true to us. So what makes something available to our emotion and cognition? Two things, recency and severity. Very recent things are easy to recall. Sure, you had yogurt for breakfast today, but what did you have for lunch three weeks ago on Tuesday? And for my friends who use calorie trackers, you're not allowed to look. Um, going back to aircraft accidents, uh, when they happen, they're generally bad, but we still fly. Even after the Boeing 737 MAX issues, people were continuing to fly. Uh, and it's because it's not that severe of a memory. Uh, if we watch the plane falls from the sky, probably wouldn't be flying. Research tells us a lot of things about how we remember stuff. Two key factors, recency and severity. Brian, I think this, you wanted to jump in on this. Yeah, well, I was thinking about this, Brian. Mm -hmm. And you know, this happens every day in a distribution company. Think about the, uh, the person on the counter who we were out of something and just got lit up by the customer really upset we didn't have it. So what happens when it's time to order that product line again? I have to have this. Mm -hmm. I have to order this. But you know what? It might have been the right decision not to have it. It might have been the right thing financially and for the company. And yet, because they had this emotional experience around it, they're going to order it. You know, these are things where you really want to rely on something else to help with this decision to get yourself out of that that mindset that pushes you down uh, a path due to the emotion of the situation uh, happens every day. Mm -hmm. And Gloria, do we have anything coming in from the uh, Q&A yet? We do. We have a question that was sent directly to me. And that question, let me just move my Q&A bubble out of the way in my and my poll. Uh, the first question, it says, we're more of an order taker or catalog house. How can we build relationships with our customers? Great question, by the way. Yeah, that's a, that's a, great, uh, a great question. And going back to some of the content, right? Information disclosure and problem solving are critical. So, um, you know, in an order taking environment, you're going to be transactive. That's life. Uh, but when, we're, when we do have the opportunity to interact with a customer, make it personal. So personalized thank you emails, not a form letter that says, you know, dear Gloria, thank you so much for this order. We really appreciate it. Signed the marketing team, right? Spend some time, thank the customer for the order. Um, make sure you're matching tone. So if, if a customer emails in hot about something, make sure you're communicating your understanding of them. Imagine if you, you know, to Brian's point about the upset customer at, at the counter, somebody shoots in that, you know, your, your part was running late. Do not reply with, Gloria, we're so glad you contacted us, right? Be empathetic, start from the beginning. Gloria, it's, we are very sorry that we are out of stock of this item, yada, 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 right? Those little things where we treat people personally, even in a transactive environment, really help us 
bring it along and then disclose the information that you need to, right? That will help them. Don't just say, hey, we'll have, when we get it in, we'll advise you, you know, tell them we expect it in this amount of time and then follow up with them. Let them know. So that's, that's, that's key. When I think about that, Brian, I think about uh, having the answer quickly and accurately. And, you know, with everything connected now in social media and, and via the internet of whatever methodology or, or, or app or platform you're on, you're now graded in a customer service perspective, not just against other distributors, you're engaged against every customer service experience they've ever had. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of great ones out there. So whatever you can do to have the answer and have it right away, which is the new norm, that's what's expected, uh, really is key to, you know, having that positive of experience, even if all it is, like you say, is a, is a transactional experience, you've covered it all and you've covered it fast. That, that's, that's some great points. I, I, um, I think, I think that leads segues well to our next slide, which is on perception. Um, so funny story, my grandmother distinctly remembered that she raised us my, my, uh, my brother, my sister, and me for three years while my, while my mom was getting her master's degree. Apparently, she was over every day to cook us dinner and keep track of us as kids. And this is my, my paternal grandmother, and we'll call her grandma. The other one's mom. So if grandma uh, is in the back of the car, she's recanting this, these stories of raising us. It's my mom, my dad, and my sister. And ma's in the car as well. This is my maternal grandmother. Grandma keeps going on and on about I came down, you know, drove 30 miles over every day to take care of the kids. And Ma started remembering the same thing. And she, they, they worked out, they had like a rotating schedule. And my parents and sister, they were scratching their heads. And at the time, my sister was 11, I would have been 14, and my brother would have been in college. So it didn't make a lot of sense, because we were old enough to be home alone. And parents asked me, did did mom and grandma ever come over to take care of you? Because we don't think they did. And I'm like, no, they never did. You know, maybe once. Um, and the point here is that perception's reality. Uh, and that reality isn't shared. It's created. Uh, they believe, mom and grandma, by the end of this car ride, completely believe they had raised us when they never did. Um, and so if we can be deluded, um, how, how do we know that we're actually in reality? Well, that means we need an external reference, right? Checking onto something, checking into something is critically important. Gloria, we have another poll question, I believe. Excellent. So quick question, uh, who throws out the first number in a sales interaction? You know, and put yourself in the position of the seller here does the seller throw out the first number or does the buyer you are the seller the other guy is the buyer All right, we have uh, a little bit of a split. 60% say we do, 40% say the other guy. Um, anchoring tells us that the first number sets the, um, sets the tone. So if you're selling, throw out the number you want, right? We can actually use these little mental traps to our advantage, knowing how people think. Okay, so anchoring is important because it sets the stage for the rest of the conversation. That number became the reference point, right? Um, if the customer had lowballed us, that becomes the, the, what we're using, right? So it's easier to talk down from a high number than it is to talk up a low number. This, this anchor creates a frame, right? We've now framed the conversation because and it, it gets in the way because it influences our language around 
the discussion. So going back to the 10K versus heads and tails on 22K, that's a framing problem on top of a demonstration of our inability to use probabilistic thinking. These two things go hand in hand. Um, and in tying this together, availability messes with us because it leads us to snap judgments and quick thinking. We do our best when we can think through a problems, but our minds are polluted with examples that may or may not be relevant. And finally, we perceive situation uh, when we, uh, how we perceive a situation affects our ability to experience empathy and share reality. If I don't have the same reality as the other person, we're not talking about the same thing. We're just yelling at each other. We might as well be on Facebook or something. Um, so when we have reality conflict, we can't use creative problem solving. Um, creative problem solving is based in creating options, building win-win situations, not claiming the pie. Solving a problem with a customer, best way to make them a long-term customer. So if we, if we don't have clear judgment, we can't do good problem solving. And Brian, I think you had uh, something to say here. Probably helps if I'm not muted, huh? That's true. Uh <laughs> You know, I think about this and uh, probably uh, sharing too much here, but I really enjoy a good poker game. And if there's any poker players out there, how much of a difference is it when, you know, you're at the next round of betting, the person who leads and puts the bet out there first, you've just framed it, you've just set the stage, you've just guided what's going to happen next. Huge difference than winding up playing defense if you sit back and let, let things occur on their own and then you get to jump in. Somebody else has already defined your choices for you. Somebody else has already set up the, the situation. So, uh, you know, back to, to Brian's point previously of, you know, who puts out the first number? Uh, what a difference, you know, maybe something to think about and, and how that's going to go or, or observe a few transactions each way and see how that feels when you're in the sales cycle. It might be very illuminating. Excellent points. Excellent points. So here's a good question. How can analytics help? Well, remember that these are cognitive biases. They're not emotional ones. So this is actually our thinking, the thing we like to rely on, uh, that is screwing us up. Um, when we feel comfortable, right, when we feel assured, we're more likely to rely on our cognitive thinking. So how can analytics help? Well, let's start by using them as an anchor for reality. Spending just a few minutes before each planned customer interaction can greatly improve our outcomes because it lets us use our full facility to make plans, formulate options, consider ideas, and make decisions. When we're underprepared, we're likely to make poor decisions because we're relying on that shortcut thinking we have, all those biases and heuristics. There's more than just a single interaction. Your ERP and CRM data are literally a gold mine. Take time to review and analyze your data uh, and that can help you spot trends as they form. A well-constructed analytics package will present data to you, not just in columnar form, but in meaningful visual visualizations. You should be able to see what's happening, not just find invoice lines. When we can see these trends, we get an idea of the behavior of our buyers. Are they biting? If they're not, it's time for some failure mode analysis. If they are, are they biting a bit too much? You could be leaving money on the table. I'm a firm believer that we shouldn't get every piece of business that we quote. I, I think this is a great exercise for kind of any business. Uh, find your six best sales months over the last four years. Now go through there if you can and examine the quote to close ratio in the preceding two months from each of those. So what was the average? That might be a good indicator, uh, assuming you have good data quality, right? You, you actually keep track of your wins and losses on quotes uh, of an ideal close ratio. You wanna be mindful about large projects throwing off your numbers. If you've got a lot of peaks in your data, especially if you work in capital goods, throw out some of the top end and rerun the same analysis. Take, take your 95% window, forget the other 5% on, you know, two and a half percent on either side. Um, 
And so what may seem like a mediocre month might actually be a good bread and butter month. Um, and so another thing to look at besides just the, the, the whole quote to close ratio is kind of what closes analysis. Slice and dice it by product category, um, subline, you know, whatever, whatever it is that you can meaningfully break up your business. Um, what does your quote to close ratio look like in those categories? And then what does your order volume look like? Um, your sellers may instinctually know this, but they may not be saying it. And you may see it, but if you have it and you're going through this thought process, you can use it in your marketing and operations planning. So you've got an ERP system, obviously. You're on this call, this is Tug. Um, but what are you tr where are you tracking information that it doesn't track? Well, that's what a CRM's for. When you have the two, you can really get a hold of your business. Um, with the two systems, um, we need to marry that data up to create meaningful information. And what's meaningful information? It's reporting, dashboards, and visualizations that help us make decisions, take action, or spur conversations. A general ledger report isn't really that meaningful. It's chock full of information, but it rarely causes a conversation. And when it does, it's probably not a good thing. Um, and we keep making more and more information. And that's why we need to shape the seller's interaction with these systems. And we've one thing we, we'll show you here in a second is a pre-call checklist that uh, Focus 10 and me uh, and White Cup have developed to help your sellers do just that. Um, it helps them prepare for the, sell, for the sales call by asking them to jot down some important information. Uh, it's a paper tool and I encourage it to be hand filled because that tactile writing actually helps our thinking. Plus it keeps your uh, sellers from whipping open their laptop in the middle of a sales call. Um, and once you have distractions in the room, it's just, it's, that's the end of it. And, and while I get that up, Brian, I think you had something to say on this. Well, uh, White Cup Solutions, uh, you, by the way, you may know us as MITS, you might know us as Tour de Force. Uh, our platform is all about, you know, improving both your top line and your, your bottom line, your net profit. And, you know, we get asked the question a lot about, well, why not just use the ERP reporting? Or, you know, why do I need CRM? Why do I need BI? And that question is often really about the same as, which is a better vehicle? Is it a pickup truck or say a Porsche 911? Which one's the better vehicle? And the answer is, well, it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're doing yard work and need a load of gravel, I'm pretty sure the pickup might be your choice. And uh, ERPs are the same way. You know, ERPs are fantastic at transactional records and the nuts and bolts of and process of running your company. The fact and the, the way that makes them great at that are the things that make them less good at reporting and dashboards and providing context around the information. So it's, it's, um, it, it's kind of a, a complementary type thing. Um, in terms of this, right, it's, it's, it's really about completing the circle. So it's not enough to know what to do if you don't have a process in place to make sure it happens and be accountable that it happens and organize it so it happens in an efficient way. And it doesn't do any good to have a great process in place if you're doing things that don't really matter or, or make a difference to the company. And so I uh, really want to encourage people to think of that in terms of really putting together a holistic approach all the way to results, because, you know, results is what really matters. You know, knowing these things is, is all fine and dandy, but having the results is what counts. And when you use something like this checklist, you're setting yourself up to have all the information you need to push it all the way through to results uh, along with a, a BI tool and, and your CRM. Yeah, and, and here's here's the tool uh, and you can get it, I, I think by, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but sign, you have to contact afterwards, I think. Um, so what we're asking your salespeople to do really briefly, jot down these things. Who am I going to see? Who's my contact there? Where is it? When is it? What's my goal for the meeting? Um, then, you know, especially for a maintenance call, or what's our year-to-date sales look like? How about our 12-month sales? Are we trending up, down, sideways? Last orders, quotes, and I say last touch, that means last interaction. You know, what was it? Who did we do? Or who did we talk to? And 
what was it through uh, and go review it. This isn't just to fill out the information. It's to help us remember. Uh, are there any focus products we should be talking to them about? Are there any new contacts to the business? Do we notice that there's any missing account fields that we should try to figure out? Um, like if you're tracking, say what the, um, uh, uh, you know, their, their facility sizes or um, how many employees they have. Great things to find out. And then jot down some potential issues. What do you see? You know, is that last order running late? Uh, did, did we have a quote outstanding that we need to close up? Were there any open issues that we owed them a response on? And then finally, you know, jot some notes down. But, but tools like this, simple little checklists, help us not get caught in those traps. So let's get back to the slideshow. Stop show. I did the thing I was supposed to do. Okay, so uh, I think that brings us to our Q&A section. I'm right here with you. And we do have some questions that have populated. And Brian F., we do have Brian Squared today. Brian F., if you want to jump on camera, you might want to chime in and answer these between the two of you as well. So the first question that we have is, We've invested in analytics and CRM in the past, and we've had lousy usage. How can we overcome that? Good question, by the way. And common. <laughs> Very. <Yeah. laughs> Turns out I made a career around it. Um, so a couple, couple pro tips. Um, whenever you're launching something that requires people to change the way they're doing it, make it part, build it into the accountability structure. So if you hold your salespeople just accountable for getting orders, that's what they're going to do. If their, op if, their, if their time option is between entering CRM data and getting orders, even though we know entering CRM data will get them more orders in the long run, they're going to go chase the orders. So make it part of the accountability structure. Your leaders, your sales managers need to be conversing with them about it and using information that they put in there as part of their conversations. And then, you know, using tools like the pre-call checklist to, to lean into these sales intelligence tools, you know, and adapt it for your business. Take that thing and run with it. You know, that's a template. Um, so that, that, that's, that's my advice on there. Brian? So I'm dating myself, but, you know, when CRM tools really started come in vogue back in, you know, the 80s and 90s, you know, they were really just a way to make sure the salesperson wasn't napping behind the Denny's, right? It was punitive. It was just, you know, big brother watching and who wants to adopt that, right? No kidding. The sales team didn't really want to jump in and, and embrace that because all it's going to be is a, it's like going out the backyard and, and get your own switch to get beaten with. So today, though, there are so many things that you can add into this, like the BI, a BI tool, where you can actually use that in conjunction with the CRM to get more sales. Suddenly, there's a benefit to the salesperson. So my advice there is look for where those benefits and those wins can come from, whether it's by itself or in conjunction with the BI tool, celebrate those wins, and then go find more, you know, start a pattern of success. Uh, it in order to get the adoption, you have to find a way for it to mean something more than just an accountability tool. Absolutely. Hey, Brian H., can I ask you to scoot back to that slide that has your um, uh, pre-content on it? And oh, invite... pre-call checklist? Sure. Yeah, and, I'd and I think it's a good place for us to also invite people to just grab a screenshot of that because I know that that's okay with you because it's going to sure. be recorded anyhow. But if you all want to, um, if you want to scoot back over to that, and then I invite everybody online to go ahead and capture that uh, so that you can duplicate it and use it in your day-to-day -day business operations. Or, Great tool, Brian H. Or shoot Thank one you. of us an email and we'll send it to you. Better yeah. yet, still. And uh, here we I go. See, so I you guys should be seeing this in Teams now, right? Yes. Perfect. Yep. And I see also that uh, that Brian F and Brian H both have their email addresses and also their website so that you can jump over and capture those too. So if you want to scoot over and look at anything, you can open a tab and not go, oh my gosh, I didn't get that, you know? <laughs> so uh, next question then is our leadership is sensitive about sharing financial information with our salespeople. <clears throat> Pardon me. How could we expect something like this to work in light of that? That's a great question. Um, you know, especially in highly competitive industries or in 
um, very tight margin industries, I've seen it happen more often that, you know, people are a little more restrictive with information. Um, structuring permissions is critical, right? Making sure people have access to the information they need. The other way, you know, so like that, that lets us say, okay, well, you can have, this is your kingdom, you know, we have this big kingdom and everybody has their little fiefdom in it, but that can create some issues. Another good way is building good visualizations, right? So give them the information they need, compute it and put it out there. That way they have that result based in for, or, you know, the results of the analytics, you don't have to open it up to the line item details. Brian? Uh, you, yeah, you covered where I was going to go, which is, uh, you know, use security and permissions, right? You have most, most BI tools have a full suite of that and can go all the way down to specific pieces of data that they can see or not see. And then it's really just about a choice. What, what do I want them to see? And if, you know, you have to admit, if you don't give them the tools they need to make the choices you want them to make, well, that's, that's on the, the admin, that's on the mm -hmm. administration to make sure that you've set that up properly. But um, yeah, you, you can, you can shield that however you need to, to, to make that make sense. Um, I have one more question here. It says, we're, we're already using uh, facts and it gives the salespeople a lot of information. Why should we consider spending more on this? Love that's it. a great question, <laughs> Brian. Since why don't, why don't you start and I'll fill in? I, it's a, we'll turn it. We'll change it up on this one. Yeah. So proof's in the pudding. Uh, and I told myself I wasn't going to give a sales pitch today, but I can't resist on this one because <laughs> really, uh, shoot me an email. Let me show you. Uh, you know, fax has a reporting suite associated with it. It's nowhere near as robust or as easy to use from a user perspective. Part of the sea change that I want people to consider here is this notion of, is the IT team going to build these things and push it out and maybe several times until they get exactly what the person's looking for? You know, there's a delay in time and uh, we're set up to make that user friendly. You don't have to be an IT person. You don't have to be a programmer. You can go in and look for the data and bring it out, build your own reports as you go with whatever you need at the moment that's going to help you do whatever you need to do right now. Uh, to go along with that, then there's pre-made content as well, you know, dashboards and, and reports that have already been developed around distribution that really make a difference compared to what you've got today. The short answer is, Call me. I'd love to show you. Uh, there's a lot there that we can talk about. Sorry for the sales pitch, but I couldn't resist on that one. That's just a softball. Not, not anything to worry about at all. <laughs> that, that really concludes the number of questions that we have right now. So with your permission, gentlemen, I would like to take a moment, first of all, to thank the two of you, our Brian Squareds that we have. Got a little confusing during rehearsal, but we, we were able to, to knock it out. So thank you so much. And also to everyone who has joined us online today, taking time out of your busy schedule to see what kind of options you have with a white cap, so white, white cup solution. Now our next two upcoming webinars will be this Friday, October 8th at 12 o'clock PM with a first up a plus network group meeting. And then they'll be looking at third party solutions followed by a 2 PM Eastern time webinar led by Della Kofelt that will, she'll be sharing your margin starts with your buyer. So watch your inbox for those invitations. And always you can check under the education webinar on the tug landing page for our upcoming content. Now, speaking of content, we also want to invite you, if you've not yet registered, you have until October 31st to view over 280 sessions that were presented this May at Tug Connects, and it's, it's delineated by your ERP that you're running on. And also, if you have a niche specialty, say, for example, that you're in procurement, HR, um, finance, whatever that track is. So make sure that you know you take advantage of that before it goes away on the final day of October 31st. And with that, we'd like to invite those of you who are members on our, in our Tug community to continue this discussion within our member-only forum. Another great reason to join because that's literally 24 karat gold. And for those of you who aren't members yet, hop on over to www.theusergroup.org. And I say join today. Gentlemen, again, thank you. Thank you to everyone again who joined us. And as they say in Hollywood, folks, that's a wrap. <laughs>